All right, so that's it for the family-wise error rate. And now we're going to move on to a topic called the false discovery rate, which is sort of a more contemporary take on multiple testing. So it really goes back to this table, where remember, this corresponds to the possible outcomes for M hypothesis tests that we've conducted. And we can control for each hypothesis test which row we're in, because we know how many hypotheses we've rejected and how many null hypotheses we haven't rejected. But we don't ever know uh, what the values in the columns are, because the columns correspond to the, the ground truth, which, of course, we don't have access to. So the family-wise error rate focuses on controlling the probability that V is greater than 1, the probability of falsely rejecting any null hypothesis. And in Garrett's example of a criminal defendant, again, this corresponds to the idea of having M defendants on trial, and V is the event that we falsely convict someone who's innocent. That's really bad. So the family-wise error rate is what we've been talking about so far. We want it to be small. But the issue is that in a lot of settings, we're not actually dealing with potentially um, sending someone to prison for a crime they didn't commit. In a lot of settings, we might be okay occasionally having a type 1 error. And the reason we might be okay with the type 1 error is because trying to avoid any type 1 errors, like the family-wise error rate is doing, might just be too tough of an ask when M is large. Yeah, but it might involve just us never rejecting anything. Right. And so, again, in the case of a criminal defendant, that might be okay because maybe the cost of falsely convicting even one person is just a cost that we're not willing to bear. But there are other settings where we might be able to occasionally make some type 1 errors in exchange for being able to reject a larger number of null hypotheses. So that leads to this idea called the false discovery rate. And the false discovery rate, or the FDR, is the expectation of V divided by R. So if we look at this table, R is the total number of null hypotheses that we reject. And V is the subset of those rejected null hypotheses for which the null hypothesis actually holds. So those are the errors. So the FDR is just the fraction of the rejected null hypotheses that were actually true, that we actually shouldn't have rejected. And that E notation means that this is an expectation. On average, we, we might have a false discovery rate of, say, what would a no good number be here? 20%, let's say. 20%. And so that would indicate that of all the null hypotheses we rejected, we expect about 20% of those uh, to be false discoveries and 80% of them to be correct right. discoveries. So this idea of false discovery rate is useful in some applications and not others. So again, um, in a in a... The, the context of a criminal defense um, setting, we would be really, really unhappy if 20% of the people who we convicted were actually innocent. Like, that is clearly not going to be okay. Right. But there's some other settings where a false discovery rate could make sense. So, for example, let's say that you're a scientist and you're testing M drug targets, where M is maybe 10,000, um, to see if they might be um, useful against uh I don't know, hypothetically, a virus that's caused a um, huge pandemic the last 18 months, hypothetically. Um, and you don't want to have too many false positives. But on the other hand, you might be okay with the false discovery rate of 20% because any drug target that seems promising against COVID, you're going to, of course, follow up on in the lab extensively. So that's a setting where you'd be okay with um, having a larger number of type 1 errors in exchange for having a lot of drug targets that you can do follow-up investigation on but you don't want too many type 1 errors. You want that false discovery rate to be capped at maybe 20% or 10%, depending on how many resources your lab has to, to follow up on those drug targets. Yep. All right. So the false discovery rate, it's the expectation of this ratio, which is the number of false rejections divided by the total number of rejections. We have 20,000 drug candidates. We want to identify a smaller set of promising candidates to investigate further. But we don't want the smaller set of promising candidates to have too much garbage. We want some assurance that that, that set of quote-unquote promising drug candidates really is promising. So we want the FDR to be not too big. In the setting, family-wise error rate really isn't the right thing because family-wise error rate would help the scientists be sure that no yeah. drug targets are false positives. But again, some false positives are okay. You just don't and want to have and the many. reality is that if you try to control the family-wise error rate in that setting, you probably just end up finding nothing. That's right, exactly. Because 20,000 is a really big number. All right, so it turns out that there's a really, I don't want to say easy way to control the FDR, because as you'll see, it's sort of a little bit unintuitive, but let's just say a, a very uh, clearly defined procedure that's actually going to allow us to control the FDR, and this is called um, Benjamini Hochberg. And I think that um, one of the videos as part of this online course actually may possibly include an interview with Benjamini. 
So here's the idea between, behind the Benjamini Hochberg procedure. First, you're going to specify Q. That's the level at which to control the false discovery rate. So when we were talking about type 1 error and family-wise error rate, we usually use alpha as our letter. And now our letter is going to be Q. And now we're going to compute p-values for each of our M null hypotheses. We're going to order those p-values, where again, p sub 1 with the parentheses indicates the smallest of the M p-values, and p sub M indicates the largest of the M p-values. So, so far, this looks a lot actually like that home procedure mm -hmm. that Gareth showed us. And now I'm going to define L, and L is going to be the largest value of J, such that the Jth smallest p-value is less than qj over M. Oh, goodness, Gareth, that's quite a mouthful. Yep, that's why I let you present it. Right. <laughs> Um, so, again, it's the largest value of J such that the Jth smallest null hypothesis is less than Q, which is my FDR threshold, like maybe 0.1 or something, times J divided by M, where M is the number of null hypotheses. And then we're going to reject all of the null hypotheses that have p-values smaller than p sub L. So p-values smaller than the Lth smallest p-value. And if we do this procedure, then through magic, the false discovery rate is going to be less than or equal to Q. It's not really magic. Statistical theory, Stati maybe? Statistical theory. Should we call it that? Okay. So the FGR is going to be less than or equal to Q. I'll say the argument for why Bonferroni procedure works, uh, Gareth showed it to us. It was a couple of lines. The argument for why the benjamini hochberg procedure works is, is more involved. All right. So in this slide, um, we can sort of see... What happens if we compare the false discovery rate to the family-wise error rate? And this is an example where we have a whole bunch of p-values, in particular 2,000 p-values for m equals 2,000 null hypotheses. And here the p-values have been ordered from smallest to largest. So the x-axis ind indexes those ordered p-values, and the y-axis shows you the value of the p-value on the log scale. And suppose that we want to control the family-wise error rate at level alpha equals 0.1 using a Bonferroni correction. Well, that corresponds to rejecting any null hypotheses for which the p-value is below the green line. So you can see that horizontal green line. That corresponds to 0.1 divided by 2,000. Remember, this is the y-axis is on the log scale. And we can see that none of these 2,000 p-values fall below the green line. That's disappointing. It's very disappointing. It's like, you know, we put in all this money to conduct the study. We tested 2,000 things, and we're unable to reject any of them at an FWER, at a false family-wise error rate of level alpha equals 0.1. So it's very sad. Even so, though some of those p-values look pretty small. They do look pretty small, don't they? Yeah, I'm feeling really disappointed, actually, by this finding. Lack of finding. You can't publish a paper on this. But in, if instead we think about the false discovery rate, if we control the level, uh, the false discovery rate at level 0.1, or 10% with benjamini hochberg then that amounts to rejecting all of the null hypotheses that are shown in blue. And you can see that's a whole bunch of blue null hypotheses, or rather a whole bunch of p-values corresponding to null hypotheses that we're going to reject. So what's going on here? Um, well, if you look at that red line, and we go back to the benjamini hochberg procedure, the red line corresponds to a line with slope q over m. And that's because if you look at step four here, I want to find the largest value of j such that the, the p-value is less than qj over m. So this red line has slope q over m. And what I want is the largest p-value index such that the p-value falls below that red line. And that actually is right here. Can you see that? It's like the, the rightmost blue point. So that's why the blue points are all here is because these are the, the p-values that are less than the Lth largest p-value, where here L is the last time that a p-value falls below that red line. So using Benjamin Hopper, we were able to reject a lot of null hypotheses, Gareth. Yeah, a lot better. This is really great. But remember, FDR, it seems like a win because it allowed us to reject a lot more null hypotheses, but the, the guarantees that we're getting are really different. So again, with the family-wise error rate, we're saying we're not willing to make any mistakes, or rather, we, we want no more than a 10% chance of having any false positives. And with FDR, I'm like, hey, false positives are fine. Like, I'm cool with false positives. Please just don't give me too many. I don't want more than 10% of my discoveries to be false. Yeah. All right. So we can go back, actually, to the fun data where we have these five p-values. We order them again. So the smallest is 0.006, the largest is 0.918. And we can think about applying benjamini hochberg So we need to compare the smallest p-value to 0.05 over 5, the second smallest p-value to 2 times 0.05 over 5, 
the third to three times 0.05 over five, the fourth to four times 0.05 over five, and finally the fifth gets compared just to 0.05. And then we need to look for the largest index such that the p-value is less than the threshold that we're comparing it to. And we see that for p1 and for p2, those p-values are smaller than the threshold, but starting with the third smallest p-value, the p-values actually exceed the threshold. So that means that we can only reject the null hypotheses corresponding to the two smallest p-values. And again, that corresponds to the first and the third manager. So we're going to reject the first and the third null hypothesis using Benjamin Hochberg at level 0.05. Great. So this is actually an example where um, on this fund data, the um, using FDR as opposed to the home procedure did not lead to more discoveries. Um, but usually the, the time when we're going to see a difference between FDR and family-wise error rate is if M is really, really large. And here M is pretty small, so we're not seeing much difference. Yeah. This sort of is more like the classical setting where something like family-wise error rate could make sense. Right. So here, uh, here on the slide, we're saying that... Um, Using Bonferroni and controlling the family-wise error rate, we only reject H, not 1. But if you can recall from a few slides ago, when we used home to control family-wise error rate, we did actually reject both the first and third manager.